Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Hunt. I have the wonderful privilege of serving as the Vice President of Public Policy at Colorado Christian University, where I direct our think tank, the Centennial Institute. And we're hosting a series of these webinars to help uh, our audiences um, understand some of the issues that we're facing around the coronavirus, what we can do to prepare, and most importantly, what can we do to help our families through all this? And uh, I am so honored to have Inan Weiss with us today, who uh, has produced a wonderful article on Medium, and I shared it in the email uh, that I've been following, that a lot of my colleagues and friends have been looking at, and he's got just such a wonderful background. I want to share a little bit of his background with you so you get a sense of who we're going to hear from today. So Yinan Weiss is a serial entrepreneur who has raised more than $20 million in venture capital for his startups. He is currently the CEO of a startup transforming the automotive service industry. He was previously the CEO of RallyPoint, the nation's largest networking platform for military personnel. Prior to becoming an entrepreneur, Yinan served 10 years of active duty in the military where he began his career in the Marine Corps as a scout sniper platoon commander and later served in the Army Special Forces as a commander of the Green Berets. And I gotta tell you, that's exactly who we wanna be taking advice from at this point. Uh, his awards include a Meritorious Service Medal, Bronze Star Medal, Combat Action Ribbon, and the Combat Infantry Badge. In 2015, he was recognized as a Presidential Leadership Scholar and his startup was selected for Y Combinator in 2017. Yunan is also an avid photographer, backpacker, traveler, and has three young children with his wife, Michelle. Yunan received his MBA from Harvard Business School and a BS in bioengineering from UC Berkeley. And I've asked him to come on today to really walk us through this article he published in Medium, Home Emergency Preparedness, 10 Steps to Mitigate an unlikely worst case scenario. And, uh, uh, you know, why don't we kind of turn it over to you a little bit, talk a little bit about your background. Maybe folks would like to hear about your military background. And I'm guessing that's maybe where you learned a lot of what you talked about in your article. And uh, go from there, share a little, a little bit of your background for folks. Sure, Jeff, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I grew up, I was born in Israel. Uh, I grew up in Palo Alto, California, where I live now. I've served actually 20 years in the military. I served 10 years in active duty, and I don't uh, discuss this much, but I've also been in the reserves for the last 10 years as well. So I'm a Lieutenant Colonel in the US Army Reserve right now. Uh, I'm also leading a company in the automotive industry, which is very much getting the brunt of the current economic fallout. Uh, and so I am spending time uh, triaging uh, my business, trying to salvage and, and mitigate is uh, against layoffs as much as possible. Um, I'm working on the home front. We've got three young kids. They're four, six, and eight. Uh, we just found out this morning that our au pair, uh, who, is, who is from Spain, is flying back to Spain this week because her mom is worried about what the governor of California just said. Um, so that means that my wife will not be able to work, which is very unfortunate because she's She's an epidemiologist who works for a hospital. Uh, and so she studies epidemics. And so now she's going to be watching the kids instead. Um, and also helping my network of people. So my business, my family, and then my network of friends. And that's where this article came up because I have this military background and I'm a backpacker and um, closet prepper, uh, I guess not so closet anymore. Uh, a lot of people reached out to me asking me questions about what should I be doing? How should I be preparing? What should I have? And so I, I put this article out together uh, last week to send to people in terms of what they can be doing and not only in terms of material um, material things, but also in terms of mindset. Hmm. And uh, I mean, to, can you share a little bit about maybe some of the things you learned through your experience in the military? I mean, obviously you went through some survival training but did that really establish the foundation that you had to care about? I, I guess I was a Boy Scout at one point, so being prepared was always important and, and yeah. an important ethic there. And I think uh, I watched, growing up, I watched my grandmother can peaches and pickles and all this stuff. And I, I remember asking my father one time, why did she do this? And he goes, well, she came through the Great Depression. Right. And when you go through that, you, you live a life that's prepared. 
And uh, can you talk about maybe where you did first developed that ethic and why you were concerned about even writing this article? Yeah, I think what we're going through right now is going to hopefully not scar our generations as much as the Great Depression did, although I do think it has the potential to devolve to that. I, I certainly hope it won't. Uh, I do think it is going to impress on society over the next 10 years in the same way that 9-11 made changes to our society in the 2000s. Uh, I think we will very likely see a new department, government department, Department of Homeland Medical Preparation. Mm. Um, we will see new screenings at airports. We will see uh, new screenings and hirings. Uh, we, we don't know yet. We, the future is very uncertain at this point. Um, in terms of preparation, I, I mean, I've, I've done a combat deployment with the Marine Corps in the invasion of Iraq, where I saw the country completely, uh, I mean, really disintegrate. There's no rule of law at all. It, the, the 2003 invasion of Iraq was a complete true military operation. Uh, later in, in the later years, I deployed to Iraq again. Uh, and at that point, it was more of a military civil operation. There was a government in place and it was a question of how to the military works with the government. But in 2003, I saw what a purely lawless land looks like. Um, papers don't matter. Deeds to homes don't matter. Banks don't matter. Currency doesn't matter. Um, and I, you know, took away a lot of lessons from that. And I think one difference or one thing that really sticks out to me is that while the war in Iraq was foreseen at least for a few weeks and uh, it was due to the decisions that uh, global leaders made, uh, society is much less stable than we all like to think. Mm. Um, we can live day in and day out and do our same routine and go to Starbucks and read books and see our families and, uh, and nothing bad would happen. Uh, but if we've seen things like the riots in the United States in the 60s, in Detroit, the 1992 Los Angeles riots, the 1992 LA riots went from one day LA was a completely peaceful, normal place um, to the Rodney King decision. The next day, the city was burning in rioting and fighting and merchants were shooting AR-15s off the rooftops protecting their uh, stores. And so you had a city that go within 24 hours from absolutely no sign of violence to uh, a fairly significant breakdown of rule of law. And so these are all situations that I hope I don't find myself in, but I am of the opinion that society is, um, it's a veil stability that we live in. And if this virus, for example, if we got word two hours from now that this virus is mutated and it's actually killing at a higher rate than expected, a 10% rate. We're gonna be living in a very different world. We're only one step away from a worst case scenario. And I'm not a fear monger. I'm not saying that people need to be worried about things day in and day out. My philosophy on it is this. To me, being prepared for the worst case scenario is like wearing a seatbelt. I put my seatbelt on every time I drive everywhere. Even if I get in my car and drive a mile down the road, I will put my seatbelt on. I'm not expecting to be ejected through my windshield. I'm not expecting to be hitting a, a telephone pole uh, head on at 50 miles an hour or to be swipe, swipe, side swipe. I think that's very low chance. And in fact, I think it's a low chance for me to happen at all in my life. And it's very low chance for me to happen in the next 30 seconds. But I will still put on a seatbelt because it's a three second cost of time for me that could protect against the biggest catastrophic uh, problem, which would be death. And so to me, being prepared is the same idea. It's a marginal cost. People can be prepared by spending a couple hundred dollars uh, up to, you can go out much higher, but you know, let's start, start with a couple hundred dollars. You do it once and you don't have to do it again. And you have that insurance policy. You put, it, you put those goods in the garage, you put them in your attic or you, you put them somewhere, um, your basement, and you've bought yourself some insurance policy that is just like a seatbelt. And so just because you do things to prepare yourself doesn't make you crazy, doesn't mean that you're expecting the apocalypse, doesn't mean that it's, you think that it's going to happen to you in the next year. It's, you know, it's the same reason we lock our doors. I'm not expecting somebody to try to break into my house tonight, but I still like my door every night. Wow. Um, so that's, that's a bit of a philosophy. And from like a numbers point of view, I believe like rough, roughly speaking, 
let's say there's a half a percent chance of things really going haywire in any given year of your life. That's a one in 200 years. If you really, like that's a two, that's a conservative estimate. One in 200 years that there's going to be some breakdown of rule of law. I mean, think where the world was 200 years ago. You had Napoleonic Wars. You have two world wars. We have the Great Depression. You had the Civil War. A lot of things have happened in the last 200 years. So if you just say, even if it was a 0.5% chance that something catastrophic would happen to society in any given year, that means that in the next 50 years, there's a 22% chance of it happening to your life if you, if you compound the math that way. Meaning there's like a one in four, one in five chance that this will happen in an average person's lifestyle, lifetime. It is not a far-fetched scenario. So while it's not likely to happen any given day, it is likely to happen sometime. And currently where we're facing, the, so that's my, that's my thinking, that's my background. And that's the background I've embraced my entire adult life. And that's put me in a better position to be able to give advice and to guide people during this more uncertain time. Yeah, I think we've really moved out of this idea that preppers were just kind of, you know, eccentric people that uh, were over the top. I think we've all learned over the last week that very quickly things like toilet paper can be gone. Uh, your supermarket can be really low on supplies. And if you're not prepared as, uh, as a leader of your family, you're really going to put your family uh, in some serious risk. And you walk through three scenarios in your article. Um, the first scenario being what we're currently experiencing, where supply chains are starting to feel the pinch, uh, businesses are being shut down, but we can still kind of get to the grocery store. And I think it's important as a caveat, you mentioned we should have been preparing years ago, months ago, but it's still not too late. Um, you can still right. uh, get some stuff done. Talk about maybe about scenario one, what can we be doing now? What's good for families to be doing? And for those of you all that are joining us now, we're hearing uh, from uh, Enon Weiss, who has had a, a wonderful career in the military. Uh, thank you for your service, by the way. Thank you for all you've done for our country. Uh, he's got wonderful experience there. He's uh, Harvard Business School educated, a uh, very successful entrepreneur. Um, this is someone who uh, is making the right decisions and has been trained well at our top universities, but you know, talk a little bit about scenario number one. Yeah. So for those who may not be familiar with the scenario, uh, first let me just explain the scenario mindset because I think it's going to be difficult for some people to grasp the idea of prepping. Prepping for what? Different people have different assumptions of what that means, and so I lay it out in three escalating series of scenarios. Scenario one is similar to what we have now. We have full rule of law. We don't have a breakdown of the rule of law. We have disrupt disruption in the supply chain. We have some shortages. We have limitations on movements. Um, and people are, are essentially sheltering at home or wherever their preferred location is. So that's scenario one. Scenario two is the crap, you know, if this stays, if this goes on for too long or if things get worse, basically we start to see cracks in the rule of law. We start to see breakdown in the rule of law. Um, one thing we've seen from national emergencies in terms of hurricanes and such is that the government is fairly limited in its ability to, to, do li um, to do widespread life support and to contain widespread problems. That is just not something that the government is stru uh, structured to do, uh, which I think is a good thing, actually. Um, but that's scenario two. It means that you may have to leave your house. You may have to go somewhere else. Uh, but you're eventually planning to come back to your house, maybe the next, maybe a week later or maybe a month later, but eventually things will return to normal and you're heading back to your house. That's scenario two. Scenario three is a complete breakdown in society. It's not something we've experienced in this country uh, yet, and hopefully we will not experience it uh, in our lifetime or in our children or grandchildren's lifetime. But it is a complete breakdown in society, which means that if you live in an urban center, you, you're leaving and you're not coming back. And then the question is, what are you going to do? Um, so let's discuss scenario one, which we're, many of us are in now or are becoming more of that. Uh, and so scenario one is actually quite uh, peaceful. We have rule of law, but we may have shortages of supplies. And we do have to be concerned about, to a certain extent, um, other people who may not be as prepared as, as you are. So scenario one is pretty straightforward. You need three 
critical uh, elements in your life. You need food, you need water, and you need medicine. Okay, you can get by without toilet paper. Uh, you know, if you, if you have a newspaper subscription, you still get newspapers, so you can use a newspaper. Um, you can use, you know, uh, plants. You know, let's not freak out about toilet paper. Um, <laughs> let's not freak out about hygiene and, and soap and, and, and those things. Don't get me wrong, those are nice things to have. We have them in our house. But the critical things you need are food, water, and medicine. And the medicine is especially important depending on how um, severe your medical condition is, if you have any. And so for food, what I would recommend normally is freeze dried food, which has an incredibly long shelf life. You can buy it once in your life and it will be good for decades. Uh, it tastes fine. It has no preservatives. It has, it's a healthy meal. Uh, I eat it from time to time when I go backpacking or even around the house. Uh, right now you cannot buy freeze dried food. Like that, that horse has left the barn. There's no supply left anywhere to buy, uh, at least not online. You might be able to find some in your sporting goods stores, but I will be very surprised. Uh, so that is a note for yourself. After this, you can buy some freeze dried food, put it in your garage, in your attic, in your basement. Uh, you can buy a month worth of supply for a couple hundred dollars. You buy it, you forget about it. You never have to think about it again. Um, that's not available right now. Uh, and so focus on foods that have a high caloric density uh, and that are a staple, you know, rice, pasta, peanut butter, uh, basic foods like that. But whatever the case is, just have at least a week to two weeks of supply in your house and do the calculations. How many people live in your house? How many calories you need per day per person? And have that as your, not as your working capital of food, but have that as a storage of food, one to two weeks. I don't think more than one or two weeks is really necessary because if we're not able to resupply ourselves with food after one or two weeks, we're no longer in this scenario. We're now having a breakdown of rule of law because other people will not be prepared as much as you are. And so if there's no resupply of food in this country for two weeks, we've got other situation, other problems going on. So have on the side two weeks of food, buy what you like. It doesn't have to be anything special. Uh, after all this is said and done, make a note for yourself in your calendar. When, when, when this is all over, uh, I would get some freeze dried food. Now, uh, which you can just buy on Amazon or uh, outdoor sporting goods store, et cetera. Now, the second thing is water. Uh, my suggestion is you wanna have large containers, five gallons, 10 gallons of water, like the sport coolers or like the GI cans, or you can get a bucket with a lid if you, if you absolutely have to, but get something that's multiple gallons of water that you can take with you if you need it. So like one, one quart ounce of one quart uh, plastic bottles of water is a fine, uh, but that's not what I'm talking about. You wanna have something that's larger that you can also put in your garage and not worry about it. That's your strategic reserve of water. That, and the, the key thing, instead of filling up your bathtub with water is that you can take it with you if you have to go. Mm. People can last without food for a very long time. A week, two weeks, you actually will not die. But within a couple of days, if you're not drinking water, it's the, you're not going to survive. Um, you want to ration at least one, have at least one or two gallons of water per person in your, in your household per day. So if you're a family of five, let's say you have uh, seven and a half gallons per day, you want to have five days, you're talking 30, 40 gallons to get a couple buckets of water uh, or water containers, like the big Gatorade kind, you know, whatever you want. Um, and just put that in your attic, put that in your garage with all your emergency supplies. Another consideration with water is water filters. People assume that their tap water is gonna be clean. Um, it may not be clean because the water you know, purification utility company is not working properly. Uh, there can be a contamination in the water system. Um, it, it, we take for granted that we turn on the hose or turn on the faucet and we have good cleaning, clean water. Most of the world does not have that privilege. It is not a crazy scenario to think that you may not be in that situation. And so water filters are very important. Um, in the article, I referenced a couple. Um, there is a uh, life straw, which you can buy. Um, it's just a, it's a one quart bottle of water and it, the filter is inside the, the bottle. So when you drink, you, you, you drink through it, it's just like drinking through a normal bottle, but the filter is in line with your drinking. Um, 
those are uh, on Amazon. They were available 10 days ago. Right now, they are available with about a two-week delay as the last time I checked, and I'm sure that's going to escalate depending on where you are in the country. Um, if you have a local sporting goods store like an REI or something like that, I would go there and get the water filters. Um, another water filter I would recommend is called Sawyer. Uh, it's more of a backpacking water filter. The thing is about the Sawyer, it's good for 100,000 gallons. It's basically a lifetime supply, and it's about, it's about this big. It weighs about three ounces, and it's like $30. So that's what I'm talking about. That's your seatbelt. Like That's what I'm talking about in terms of uh, I think it'd be economically silly not to invest $30 in a water filter that can filter water for the rest of your life that weighs three ounces um, to put that in your bag, right? Like why not have that? doesn't make it crazy to have that. Uh, plus it's good for backpacking. Um, so <laughs> having, having some sort of water filter uh, and I would go redundant. I would have several water filters because they can get clogged up. Um, they can break, they can fail. So I would have a couple. And then the third is medicine. So let me pick it up in the prescription and non-prescription medicine. Prescription medicine is between you and your doctor. Uh, you can't really stock up usually in prescri prescription medicine, but as scenarios start to worsen, uh, I would go to your doctor, if you could do it over the phone, ideally, get a backup supply of medicine because that supply may not be there if you're counting on it. Uh, and then in the over-the-counter medicine, um, you wanna get uh, Imodium, anti-diarrheal diarrheal, uh, medicine. Uh, diarrhea is the world's second cause of death in children under five. It is, it is uh, something we take for granted in the United States because our water is clean. Because, you know, you, sometimes you, if you travel overseas and you joke about not drinking the water or you may, may get sick. Well, if you're in a situation where there's no hospital to go to, that can be deadly because your body cannot hold fluids. So having some supply of the emodium or the ingredients in emodium, uh, a decent supply would be number one on non-prescription. Um, number two would be basic ibuprofen and or aspirin for pain medicine, uh, chapstick if you're gonna be exposed to the sun, um, liquid bandage. So like it's called New Skin as a brand. Uh, it's basically crazy glue with an antiseptic. And if you've ever gotten crazy glue in your fingers, you know it's stuck to your fingers and it covers your skin up. Well, whoever made that made crazy glue and put an antiseptic into it. And so instead of putting a bandage on something, you just roll it across your cuts and it serves as a bandage and it stays on much longer than um, you know, normal bandages. You can still put normal bandages over it, but uh, it's, it's antiseptic and it will protect your skin much better. And it stays on there for a much longer time. So things like new skin and then traditional medical kits, those like red, red medical kits that you see that a lot of people have that they may not know what's in it. It's got your assortment of bandages and, 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 uh, and tapes and things like that. So I mean, that's, a, that's a basic, that's a very basic list for scenario one, which is you're gonna be at home for a while and there may be a slowdown and a disruption in the supply chain, but you still can count on the rule of law. That's very helpful. Thank you, Inan. Uh, now, as we move into scenario B, one thing that I know uh, people in Colorado love are their guns. And you talk a bit about the importance of having a gun and having nearly a thousand uh, bullets and ammo to be able to, to use. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um... By the way, for scenario A, there's some other miscellaneous items like batteries and chargers and things like that, that you can find in the, in the article um, that are, again, designed to be stabilizing elements. Um, for the larger scenario, yeah, I mean, I'm a big pro Second Amendment person. Uh, I think we are fortunate to live in a country that has a Second Amendment and we are allowed to defend ourselves. And... Uh, it's a controversial topic across this country. Uh, but for me to be able to defend my family, I think is an inalienable, inalienable right. And I will defend my family if necessary. And so a lot of people ask, and there's maybe a lot of people in this room and in this, in, this, in this hangout here that have many firearms and you may already be a firearm expert, uh, in which case I know we would have fun debating calibers and things like that someday. Uh, but for the general public that may not spend much time thinking about it, my personal recommendation is as a very basic, if you don't have anything, 
you should have a handgun in your house. Put it, you should know how to use it and you should put it in a safe. And having a handgun versus having nothing in a breakdown of rule of law is, I mean, that's like the difference between, you know, crawling and flying. Uh, being able to have a handgun in your house is a huge um, defense measure. Uh, for handguns, if, if we, can, we can discuss this for a long time because people have the personal preferences. I think the most important thing for a handgun is that it fits well in your hand, that it's balanced for you. It's like a sedan. You have to like kind of, there's a lot of different sedans. Which would you prefer? Which one? Whatever you like better, they're all going to function fine, whether it's a Beretta or a SIG or a Glock or an HK, they're all going to work just fine. But the main thing is it needs to fit properly in your hand. Uh, you should have at least four magazines. And I personally recommend at least a thousand rounds in case you go into scenario C, meaning you're leaving your house and you're going into the unknown territory. As unlikely as it is, maybe it's a one in a thousand chance. That means there's probably you know a 10% chance that's gonna happen to you or your kids at some point in your life, even if it's a one in a thousand chance. And a thousand years is a long time for things to happen. So this is not such a crazy scenario. Um, so I would recommend, recommend a handgun. If you already have a handgun, I, I would recommend two handguns over one. Two is better than one. Um, beyond that, I would get a 5.56 millimeter rifle, an AR-15 style rifle. That would be a secondary. That's a little bit more advanced, um, but is pretty much the, it's the most popular firearm in this country. Uh, parts are common. Um, you, can, you can use it at a longer range in a handgun. Um, you can also get a 12 gauge shotgun, which you can use for hunting, uh, should you need to in, in a, a scenario. Uh, but having something, even if it's just a shotgun or if it's a rifle you want to go first, uh, I recommend a handgun first. Having something is better than nothing and have ammunition for it. So I have friends from Harvard Business School who are, who are tend to be liberal leaning and they're not very gun friendly people. And they've been coming to me this week asking me for help to go buy a gun because uh, of what's going on. So I kind of been coaching some of them. I had a friend in, in Texas, a state where I would think anybody who's wanted to have a gun already has it. Uh, she went to the gun store. Um, well, first of all, I can tell in California, the gun stores are closed. In Cal I have not seen any open, well, not only are they closed because of the shutdown, but they're closed because they're sold out and they're not getting new inventory. Marty B. Reddings in LA is the largest store in the area in Los Angeles. It's been closed for over a week because they wow. sold out of everything. So this is not the best time to get something. So she, you know, she went to Texas, she went to a store. Um, she went to Dick's Sporting Goods store because they're getting out of the gun business. And so there might've been something available. At, on her way to Dick's, Sport, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods stores, the stores announced they were closing until April 2nd. She, go, she went to another gun store. Uh, she waited in line for two hours and there was, she was fortunate to buy one of the last guns at the store. And they were selling one box of ammunition per customer, 50 rounds. And this is full metal jacket, which is not the preferred ammunition type for self-defense. One box limited per customer. So that's why I say, have some ammunition with you in your house, in your, in. this is a bag you're creating that you're hoping you will never ever touch. It's your water, it's your food, it's your, it's your, it's your medicine, it's your flashlights, your batteries. It's your filters. You hope you never touch it. And I would put the ammo right there with it and at least a thousand rounds. As, you know, if you really want to go less, a minimum of 500 rounds. Um, because ammunition, when the chips are down, ammunition is going to be valuable. Right. Uh, and so that's why I would recommend having some ammunition at home. We um, in Colorado has not uh, experienced a shutdown like you have experienced in California, which I want to get to in, in just a little bit, what that experience is like. So you do have opportunities still here in the state of Colorado. Uh, we've got great friends over at the Centennial Gun Club uh, that uh, do great work, are proud supporters of the Second Amendment. So if you need to go anywhere, I recommend you head on over to the Centennial Gun Club. Uh, they'll take great care of you there. Yeah, and I, um, wait, Jeff, and I don't want to cause any sort of, you know, panic or rush. I have to get a gun. You know, this is what we're going through right now will pass and things will get better. Right. This is it's just an insurance policy. It is something that should the worst case scenario happen. You're not defenseless. That's all. Uh, you know, 
can we talk a little bit about communication? That was something yep. that struck me in your article. I've got extended family that live in this state and I never really thought about, well, what happens if our phones don't work? Uh, right. Email goes down, how do we communicate? Where do we all meet? And I thought your article provided really good guidance on that. Talk a little bit about the importance of coming up with a plan ahead of time uh, regarding communication. Yeah, I mean, emergency preparedness is not just about food, water. Uh, it's about navigation. It's about communication. It's about medicine. It's about link up plans. Um, it's about defense. And so for navigation, um, Many people in the audience here, I think, are if they're not, you know, if they're not uh, native to iPhones and digital technology, then they still have maybe you still have your old AAA maps, and you can still read a compass, and that's great. Uh, there's a lot of people in society who don't know how to do that. They don't know how to read a map. Uh, they have to rely on the phone GPS entirely, um, and they don't have a compass. And you know, those those people are have even uh, a bigger need. Uh, so for communication, let's discuss communication here for a moment, and then I'll get to navigation because I think that's also a flip side of it. Uh, we rely on our smartphones, at least I do. Most of my network relies on smartphones, instant text messaging, instant phone calls. We take that for granted, just like we take fresh water for granted. It will not always be there. And so uh, how do you communicate when the internet is down? And not only how do you communicate, but what, how, how do you have any sort of plan in place? You know, growing I'm, I'm, I'm young enough and old enough where I'm young enough where I do everything on the internet. But I'm old enough to remember what life was like before the internet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, my parents and I used to have plans like, Hey, I'll meet you here at five o'clock. And if I'm not there at five o'clock, I'll meet you here at seven o'clock. <laughs> right. And, and if, you know, and if I'm not there, then I'm going to be walking home. And well, if you're not home by eight o'clock, then I'm doing this, this, and this. Those are, the, those are things that we have not done anymore because we haven't needed to do anymore because we have instant communication. So in terms of communication, there's two types that we have to think about. There's the alternate communication and there's no communication. And so alternate communication makes the assumption that telecom internet is down. And it may be down because uh, a line is broken and people are in quarantine so they can't go fix it. It may be down because there's a power problem maybe down because everybody's on their phone at the exact same time. And so you can't use it, which happens as well. For whatever reason, you don't have communication. You don't have internet. Um, one alternative is satellite-based communication. So Garmin is a company that makes satellite-based um, text message communicators. They're called the Garmin uh, inReach. I use them for backpacking. It's how I learn about them. So I go in the wilderness. I'm, out, I'm off the grid. I can still send a text message to my wife. Uh, which is a which is good and bad to have that communication out in the wild, um, but uh, that allows you to send messages through the, the Iridium satellite network, which is a U.S. government military network. And right now, civilians can use it to send messages. So a Garmin inReach, uh, and I have an example of that in my article, is an is an alternate an example of an alternative communication plan using satellite systems instead of uh, phone networks. The other big consideration is no com. No communications. Let's say there's an emergency. Uh, the governor just uh, declared shelter in place. Nobody moved, like, immediate like, war shelter in place. The virus mutates. There's an earthquake. There's an earthquake this morning in Croatia. Buildings in the capital are, you know, some buildings in the capital fell. Natural disasters can happen on top of things. The Dust Bowl happened in the Great Depression. There's a lot of things that can happen that can make our current situation much worse. And so, what's your no communication plan? Uh, meaning where's everybody going to meet? And what if you go home and they're not there? Are you going to go looking for them? Because maybe you're out looking for them and they just got home while you're looking for them. And now they're going to go looking for you. And now you come back and you miss them. I mean, it's, it's in the day of instant communication, it's hard to fathom needing to make plans for no communication. So having a basic no comm plan of for your family, uh, where are you going to meet? Uh, what are you going to do if people don't get there? If you're leaving the house, this is from, from the military, where are you going? If you leave a note for other people who are not there. Where are you going? Who are you taking with you? When are you coming back? And what to do if you're not back by then? And where are you going to communicate this, share this information with people? And just, just having this discussion with people uh, in your family or in your group of people who are planning 
you know, can take five or 10 minutes. And that's the, that's the only investment you have to make. Uh, and that can be the difference between missing people uh, and having your family together. Mm. And then the- uh, one of the things you mentioned, that's very helpful. Thank you. And one of the things you mentioned in your article was about bug out bags too. Yep. Um, I think this could be very helpful for folks, especially that are living in a city that may need to get out quickly. Um, or even if you live in the suburbs and you need to, you need to move and, and basically get away from a dangerous area quickly. Um, talk a little bit about a bug out bag. Yeah. I mean, this is, we're entering a territory of the uh, traditional tinfoil hat preppers here um, that these days don't seem so crazy. Uh, the idea of the bug out bag is that you don't have a lot of time to plan. You've got to leave in the next 30 seconds to the next even 30 minutes. You have to leave your house. And so you should have a bag in your area, in your house, that you're going to grab, that you're going to put in your vehicle, and that is going to give you an advantage uh, to survive and thrive. And so everything I discussed in this article. I would recommend having a copy of that, having one of those in your bag, minus your food and water, because that's going to be much heavier and you can throw that in your vehicle separately. But you should have the ammunition. The gun, I'll probably keep in a safe uh, outside of that, uh, but you should have the ammunition in there, your water filter, your batteries, your maps, your GPS devices, um, your lanterns, your, uh, you know, your filters, everything in that bag so that should an emergency happen, you're not doing the calculation of, okay, honey, go grab the lights. Uh, you go grab the batteries. Oh, did I forget my holster? Did I have this or this or this? If you have to go in a hurry, that's not the time to start putting things together in a bag. And so that's what the bug out bag is. It's something that um, has your life support in there. Um, and so uh, for uh, what would make a good bug out bag, I recommend something that is soft shell, so it can fit in different configurations, like a duffel bag. And two key characteristics: one is that it has wheels, kind of like a duffel bag, like a luggage duffel bag. You can carry, or you can take with you in wheels for long distance because this thing is going to be heavy. And two, that it's got backpack straps as well, so that should you need to go off road with it, cross country, cross the woods you can put on your bag as well. Maybe you have to lighten it a little bit, but you can put in your bag as well. So those are two characteristics of a good bug out bag. And it's got all the fundamental elements of what you need to survive. And survive may not be so dramatic in terms of your life, but you know, to at least, uh, you know, an earthquake just happens. I live in California, so earthquakes are top of mind. Earthquake happens, there's a fire, and you need to leave. And so a bug out bag can even fit for those kind of scenarios. Uh, I would do want to say, folks, if you do have questions, there's a little group chat area. You're welcome to type in some questions there. If you're watching on YouTube, we've got folks watching there as well. You can uh, type a comment there and uh, we'll see it and can try to respond and ask those questions. Um, you know, as we kind of wrap up this segment here before we move on to your next article, which was the nine point recovery plan, which is going to be really important. Um, I, I, I did find it uh, insightly that you mentioned the importance of keeping your gas tank filled regularly. Um, yep. We're not only facing a, uh, the coronavirus crisis, but we're facing a war over oil and fights between two major countries over oil that's sending the oil industry all over the place. Um, we may see rationing at some point, uh, and it's important to keep your gas uh, tank filled regularly. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so normally, normal times, you know, I don't like going to the gas station, so I wait until I'm like below empty and then I go to the gas station. Um, but during these times, I'm going to the gas station anytime I'm less than seven eighths of a tank because I want my car to be on full gas if things deteriorate. I mean, in a normal year, I think there's a half percent chance of things deteriorating going sideways. Right now, maybe the odds are 10% that this year things are going to deteriorate, deteriorate rapidly. And that's, that's, that's very high probability. So um, keeping your gas, your car gassed up while we're in this crisis. And second, you can also buy those red 
gas tank containers available at most gas stations or Walmarts. And you, know, you can get a two gallon, three gallon, four gallon variation and have two or three, four gallon uh, backup in your garage as well that you can take with you. Make sure it's an actual gas container. You, know, you don't wanna put in like a milk jug or something like that. Get a, something that is designed to contain gas or typically red. Um, I just, folks were asking for links to your article. I just posted that in the chat area. So, um, if you want links to Yunan's article there, um, you can, you know, do you also want to give your blog address so that people can follow you there? Yeah. Uh, well, it's just my medium address, my medium blog that if you, you can share that with folks, I write about leadership. I write about business. I don't, I've never written about this stuff before. I don't typically like to talk about it because people think, you know, something's wrong with me. Um, <laughs> I typically write about leadership and business and philosophy uh, and, and such. But during these times, I mean, I write this so I can share this with people who need the information. We've got about 15 minutes left. And I'd love to talk about your experience in California because it's likely going to be our experience. I just saw over the news wire that uh, Louisiana just went to a shelter in place state. Yep. I imagine Colorado is going to face this soon. Share a little bit about your experience. And then also you have another article, the nine point recovery plan, which I think the, the hardest thing out of all of this, and for those of us who care deeply about the economy as well as everyone's health, is what's our exit strategy out of this? Right. So uh, talk about your experience and then your, your second article, which has kind of a recovery plan. So I've had the benefit or disadvantage of being in the first part of the country that went under quarantine in the Bay Area. This was announced last Monday. And basically all businesses are shut down minus essential businesses, which is a very, very limited list. Um, you can go out of your house to go grocery shopping and uh, get food and go seek medicine. But otherwise it's basically shelter in place. And uh, there's so many exceptions to the rule that there's still a fair amount of cars on the road. I mean, maybe if you go out, you see some cars. and so. Uh, it's not a ghost town. There's no police pulling anybody over like there is in Spain. Spain is pulling people over. You need to have papers that you have. A, you get a timestamp of when you leave the grocery store, and so and you can only be one person in the car at a time. Otherwise, the police is, is stopping you. They're checking your papers on your timestamps, um, and so it, we may end up in that situation in this country as well. But for now, it's still fairly relaxed. Uh, nobody, police isn't stopping anybody. It's just basically nobody's going to work. People are getting laid off uh, and everybody's nervous. And yes, I agree with you, Jeff. The worst part of this is that there's no communicated plan. If the government said, look guys, here's our problems. We don't have enough masks. We don't have enough ICU beds. We don't have enough ventilators and we don't have enough good testing. Therefore, we are gonna slow down the spread of this virus by sheltering in place for four weeks. And during these four weeks, we're gonna produce 3 million masks, 50,000 hospital beds, 30,000 ICU respirators, and we're going to get testing nationwide by the end of this four-week period. And I think I and many Americans would be like, okay, you know, I'll just stay at home and hang out. I still have Netflix. I still have internet. The world's okay. We'll go on. But that's not what I'm hearing from the government. I'm hearing shelter in place. Things are disastrous write it out. Hmm. And so I don't, uh, I, I don't, I don't get confidence. I don't have confidence that the current plan is actually doing what we need to do, which is building the medical capacity and being prepared to handle this as it scales, because everybody is going to be, or most people are going to be exposed to coronavirus. So it's just a question. This, all this, all this does right now is just, it just delay things. My concern is that we're not actually using this time effectively to be prepared for it, the only thing we're doing is just destroying our economy and delaying the inevitable. Uh, and so the nine point plan tries to create a little bit more, I think a little more balance to our economic needs, to our medical needs and our overall standing in the world. If you got, you know, Russia is not closed for business. Russia is not closed for coronavirus. They are driving on. China is reopened its business and they're recovering. And so you have Russia and China which are open for business. You have, uh, and Japan is as well. You have United States, which is 
crippling our economy right now with no exit plan. And frankly, I'm a little bit concerned about what this means for the balance of power in the world when all this is said and done and what hit will it be taking. So that's why, that's why I, write, I write these articles or, or wrote these ideas down. Um, so the nine point plan is number one, we need to have clear communication from the White House in terms of who is at risk, what is the level of risk to the best of our knowledge. I know it's incomplete information, but you know, whether it's by age, by existing conditions, and who is not at risk. In Italy, which has the largest number of deaths in the world, there's not a single person under 30 who has died. That doesn't mean that they can be at hazard because they can be a carrier, but it means that they are not at risk. And so we need to be honest about who is at risk and who is not, right? And establish that. Number two, we need to build the medical capacity. We need to build the ICU beds. We need to build the ventilators. We need to build the masks that we've been buying from China. We don't have any more because all of our masks, our masks are from China. So we need to build an emergency medical capacity and I would make it very visible. I would convert convention centers, arenas, uh, college dorms, parks, if you need to, to build field hospitals, put the, put, put the medical capacity with the people so that there's no panic because we will not, be, will not have a shortage of medical capacity. So focus on medical capacity building. Set up test centers. So we test people who are not showing symptoms as well. I think what that will show is that the, the fatality rate of this is extremely low. Only people getting tested are people who are symptomatic and at risk. You know, there could be 10 times, 100 times more people with this case and they're not, they're not showing any symptoms and they're not at risk. So the death rate will plummet the more people we test. Um, I think we should use smartphones to communicate with people. That there should be a daily a uh, update through everybody's smartphones in terms of how many cases there are, how many recoveries there are, what our medical capacity is, uh, how close we are to uh, our medical utilization rates. Communicate with people around the world, around the country, what is going on with a single authoritative source, maybe a, a, a text message at least per day to every person in terms of here's how we're doing with the plan. Um, direct all high risk personnel to quarantine. So if you're over 70, if you have an immune disease, if you have heart disease, if you have a combination of heart disease and diabetes, you should quarantine yourself. You're a high risk person. That's why the point number one is so important. You're a high risk person, you should quarantine yourself only medical professionals or those who have tested or people you live with should be interacting with you. Uh, so that's point five. Uh, number six is continue to limit high risk transmission events, ban conferences, ban basketball games. That's fine while we sort this out, right? So we don't want high risk transmission events. Uh, and now point seven is start to return the rest of us to normal life. Slowly open up back schools open elementary schools up. Children under 10 are not at risk for this virus. And so if th there's not been a single case in the world of a child under 10 who has died, not a single case, they're much more likely to die from the flu or from a car accident going to school. And so open up the schools, let healthy teachers go back to work. If you're an at-risk teacher, don't go back to school. But if you're a 35 year old kindergarten teacher, go back to school. Send the kids, can send, send the second graders back to school so that people like my wife who works for a hospital can work on this virus. And after elementary schools, then open up middle schools, then open up high schools, and then uh, return people to work. The economic fallout of this is just tremendous. If you're not high, if you're not high risk person, go back to work. And what I would say it is, if you can work from home, work from home, you know, avoid you know, don't need to exacerbate the problem. But if you can't work from home and you rely on your job for your livelihood, for your family, go to work, right? Um, and then the last is the stimulus package, which, you know, I'm frankly a little bit concerned about spending $2 trillion with so hastily of a plan, uh, but I think we need something. And I, I think there's enough fiscal policy gurus who can figure that out better than I can. But that'll be the ninth point. So that'll be the nine point plan. Uh this is really helpful in helping us understand a, a pathway forward. And like I mentioned, I think so much of this challenge is that uh, if it is bad and really bad, and I think, you know, and you and I were on a call probably earlier this week where someone mentioned, if you're going to go through hell, let's go through it quickly, uh, which yours doesn't uh, 
negate by any means. Uh, if we need to shut down, we need to shut down even further, but we've got to have some type of uh, plan through this because right. if we continue to flounder in unknowns, uh, that's really where our economy is going to suffer because uh, when, when you have unknowns, uh, people aren't willing to invest and right. it, it really harms us through there. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I think right now we're in the worst, worst of both worlds. I would prefer this nine point plan where we identify the high risk personnel, we quarantine them, or at least encourage them to quarantine. I don't think we should force people across against their will, but give them the resources to quarantine themselves and let the rest of this country get back to work slowly. Um, I think that's the best plan. I think the second best plan is everybody locks down, nobody moves, nobody goes anywhere, go by, you know, this is going to commence in three days, go stock up on food. And for the next three weeks, you don't leave your house. And basically, if you've had this virus, you will get over it. If you haven't had the virus, you're not going to get it afterwards because everybody who's had it is not immune to it. The problem with that plan is that the second wave, because now we have to guard the borders for our lives, because then people are going to come back into our country from out, you know, we're not going to, we can't close down our borders as much as we want to, if we wanted to, it's impossible to completely close it down. And so the problem there is what China has now, which is as this virus is going to return. But I think that's still better than this slow, this slow deteriorative, deteriorative, well, not so slow, actually, this rapid deterioration of the economy uh, with no end in sight. So number one is quarantine those who are at risk, put everybody else back to work. Number two is if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right, go all the way. And then the third and the worst option is this middle ground, which is this state's quarantining, that city's quarantining, but they're not really doing it. People are still going out. There's no plan in place. And unfortunately, that's where we are now. We do have a question coming in from Kathleen. Kathleen asked about um, cash on hand in preparation uh, for the scenarios that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, you got a little bit of that into your article, but that's a good question worth discussing. Yes. Um, so it also depends on the scenario we're talking about. Uh, because on the gravest scenario, we don't know if dollars are going to be worth anything. Uh, but if we put that kind of dramatic possibility aside, I would recommend one to two months worth of your salary in cash in your bug out bag. And don't tell anybody where your bug out bag is. <laughs> um, and so one to two months of your salary, um, should the situation get, get bad again, it's just, it's just, it's an insurance play against, against the worst possible scenarios. For those people who are getting really serious into this, um, I would also recommend having some gold and silver coins um, in your bag as well. Half ounce or, or, or smaller denomination, how much to put in there, up to you. Everybody's different. Let's say one month worth of your salary. Uh, best case scenario, you actually need it, or I guess, I don't know, worst case scenario, you actually need it uh, because it's some kind of currency and barter that you can use uh, that could potentially save you or your family's life. Uh, at, at the very least, you have an heirloom of some neat coins to pass on to your kids and grandkids that generally retain their value. So there's not much downside. Again, I, I, all this prep stuff is minimizing downside, not a lot of uh, effort for a lot of potential upside. Uh, you know, and this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. First of all, thank you again for your service to our country and to have someone that's been uh, as successful as you have been uh, with your with your military career, your education, and with your business career, sharing some tips with us has been very helpful. Uh, I think what we learned today was that there's still things you can do right now to help your family through this. I think you need to prepare that things are going to get worse uh, and, and do so now. Uh, take steps, have those conversations with your family. Where are you going to meet if communication goes down? Make sure you have enough water food, medicine, uh, build your bug out bag. Even if we get through this in the next few weeks, this is good information to have uh, for the future uh, so that you can be prepared. Um, going back to my old Boy Scout training, uh, always be prepared. My, I got three boys and Boy Scouts now. Uh, this is good stuff worth having. Uh, you know, and any final comments from you? Everybody should stay calm, uh, hope for the best and plan for the worst. And I think you, you mentioned it in your article. I just want to, is a good, just on that note that we want to, uh, your mindset should be surviving with honor. 
I, I like that a lot. Uh, maybe a few comments on that real quick. Well, that is something that we learn in POW training in the army um, in terms of, because when you're a POW, you know, you're, you're taught to resist uh, torture. Although the idea is that you're not going to resist it forever. And so as a potential POW, uh, what is the psychological scar of feeling like you compromised your integrity or compromised your na national uh, integrity? And so what the military teaches is that, you know, you're not superhuman. Everybody uh, has, everybody can break, everybody makes mistakes. Um, number one thing is you wanna survive, but you wanna be able to survive with honor. Uh, meaning that when the chips are down, you want to survive first and foremost, but you want to do it in a way that you can live with, live with yourself. And so surviving with honor means that we care about each other. We care about our fellow man. We care about our family. We care about our nation. We do the best we can every day. And if we fall short, we don't beat ourselves up over it. We do better the next day. Great way to close there. Thank you, Inan. I'm going to uh, do uh, some final announcements here. We will post this video online uh, so you can watch it later. Uh, in the meantime, we have a call tonight with uh, Congressman Doug Lamborn. Let me give you the phone number for that. That'll be at 7 p.m. It'll be our prayer conference call, 351-999-4562. Let me give that to you again, 351-999-4562. Four five six two. One more time. Three five one nine 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 four five six two. That call will be at seven p.m. tonight, and then tomorrow we're going to be doing a, another Zoom uh, with Teresa Sidebotham and Nicole Hunt of Telios Law as they discuss the legal considerations of coronavirus guidance for church gatherings. What does that mean for your church? For your pastor? Uh, you know, there are some outright bans. What does this mean for our churches? Are they bound by directives issued by government officials and agencies? And if they choose to still meet, do they face any legal consequences for doing so? Lots of questions. That'll be at 4.30 tomorrow. And uh, we'll be back on Zoom. You can also watch this on YouTube. But I want to say thank you again for Yinan uh, spending the time with us today. Uh, this was very helpful. And if you have any questions, email me at centennial at ccu.edu. At centennial at ccu that or centennial at ccu edu. Thank you all so much. God bless you, and uh, we'll look forward to speaking with you next time. Take care.